Welcome, Nutrition Hero family, to the next episode of the Nutrition Hero podcast. I'm Dr. Brad Watts. You're listening, as always, as I sit in the podcast lab, and today I have a special guest for you. This guest comes all the way from Bellevue, Washington. This guest is a functional health doctor. She's a DC with a focus on nutrition, and this guest is also the host of a very good podcast, which I'm sure we'll get into here today. Mm -hmm. It's Dr. Caitlin Szyzowski. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So for those of uh, the listeners that don't know, we were classmates back in the day at Northwestern, and um, you are one of the few that has also taken this interesting journey of functional health. So how has it been treating you? What have you been up to? It's been so much fun, so much fun. And actually, I have you and your beautiful wife to thank for this journey because without you guys, I don't think we would have went down this road. Um, But there's not a day that goes by that we regret the decision for expanding our knowledge on physiology, nutrition, you name it. It's, It's been such a fun ride. So you've been practicing in this space for... um... I mean, a handful of years, years now. Yeah, it's been, yeah. <laughs> it's been a little while. And um, what are some of the things that you appreciate about what you've learned in the functional space? Some of the applications, that type of thing. It's actually really simple. Like when you look at physiology and how things work, it's super simple. You just have to have the knowledge on how to look at things and look at things a little differently than, oh, you have a symptom, here's a pill. It's more of a, you have a symptom, okay, why is the symptom there? Because there's, like, you know, multiple causes to different symptoms. So it's it's always a fun detective journey whenever somebody sits in front of you because it's never the same. And that's why I think uh, myself and my husband love it so much is because it's so different from day to day. That that word detective is, like, key. It is the thing that... Uh, you get up and you have a, a busy schedule for the day and, and like, why would you put yourself through that day after day after day? Uh, but it's this addiction to the, the D word, I call it, the detective. And um, it's interesting that you bring that up. What are some of your favorite types of patients to serve? Ooh, so honestly, one of my soft spots is type 2 diabetes, and it's because I lost my my babcha to type 2 diabetes. She ended up with Alzheimer's, um, needing a foot amputated, but they couldn't do it because her kidneys were failing. Mm. It, was, it was a mess. Um, and so knowing what the family members go through when you see a loved one going through such a horrendous disease and knowing that it doesn't have to be like that, it could have a totally different outcome as long as you're going to do something different. That's really where my soft spot is. Um, And I do love, love, love working with hormone imbalances, especially with women. So bless you for that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, goodness. It's a hard one. It's hard because it's not just thyroid. It's estrogen, progesterone. Like, and for those of you that don't know much about it, go back and listen to uh, the podcast that you did on the female hormone cycle. You did an Mm. amazing job at explaining it Mm. and start incorporating some of the testing, like the Dutch test. I'm so glad you did a podcast on that. That's an amazing new um, means of looking at things, but it's just finding out where the balance has been broken. Like where is there not balance and what needs to be done to restore the balance? It's what is like, to me, that's logical. Like that's the logical place to start with anybody's disease or dysfunction. And what is the block that happens for a traditional provider, whether it be a chiropractor or a DO, DC, uh, MD, ND, like what in the world, where is that block? How does that logic escape uh, their practice, so to speak? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, and I don't think there's one answer to that, unfortunately. Uh, uh-huh. I think there's a couple things that happen. I think a lot of practitioners out there worry about whether the patient in front of them is going to do everything that they need them to do to get better. Sure. Uh, Because it's not as simple as here, just take this pill. It's, it's going to involve lifestyle changes, habit changes, different things, maybe more thorough testing. The testing might be more um, cumbersome. They're going to have to do multiple, you know, tests at different times. 
And so I think it's a lot of fear based on will the person actually follow through with the recommendations. And if they don't, then the doctor is going to be blamed for it. But the other thing is, the unfortunate part is, no matter where you go to school, you're pretty much taught, oh, this symptom equals this right. you know, result or this drug or this supplement or this one adjustment or whatever it is. And they're not right. looking at the person as a whole. It's segmental. And I think that's where a lot of practitioners fail. Have you experienced, um, like in chiropractic, the paradigm is MCP, mechanical, chemical, psychological. Have you experienced better wellness outcomes for your patients because you're engaging in as many wheels of that MCP as you can? Yeah. So speaking from like a chiropractic uh, philosophy, um, where the subluxation is caused not just by physical, it's chemical, emotional, mental, yeah. all of that. And I truly believe um, chiropractors need to address all, all of those aspects. You need to address, if you truly want to get somebody well, you got to address the emotional, the chemical component. So if you're not talking to people about their lifestyle, like what are they eating? Yeah. What are they putting in? What are their cleaning products? What, what are they exposing themselves to on a daily basis? Yeah. You're never actually going to address or rectify the physical subluxation that's showing up in the spinal column. Like it's just, it's never going to happen. So when I was in uh, T nine, maybe, maybe 10, I had an internship with this old doc in Minnesota. His name is Dr. Hartman and he's a great guy. He's the one that introduced me to nutrition as a causative uh, situation for a subluxation. And we were looking at x-rays one day and he goes, look at all that arthritis. And I was like, yeah, that stinks, you know, just <laughs> trying to learn whatever he's going to say. And he goes, man, I just wish people would understand that this can be a nutritional issue. And that's when it clicked and I looked at him and I was like, oh my goodness. I've never thought about it in that context before because you understand how too much caffeine can cause a fight or flight situation for somebody. And then we have subluxations result into that but arthritis that's interesting so you go down the rabbit hole and you come up 10 years later and here you are going oh my goodness there's just so much stuff that we need to tell people about that people need to know about and um and there's this thing doctors and patients they're they're always willing to get information but they're not willing to learn until it's like needed themselves you know what i mean is there a time frame? Crucial. Yeah, exactly. Is there a time frame in your life where you were like, that's what I need? That, this, the functional style of looking at physiology or whatever, I call it logical style, but that logical style of analysis, what drove you into that personally? Not just hearing about it, but what made it like hit you and then you decided to put that coat on, so to speak? Um, I don't know if you remember when the four of us were living in Denver mm -hmm. and when Niles put on 30 pounds in a month and we eat really good at that point. I in was gluten free. Wow. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> remember when I got made fun of in school cause I was gluten free because yeah. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to the bandwagon everybody. <laughs> That's um, right. <laughs> but he put on 30 pounds in a month and we looked at everything and was like, okay, what is going on? And um, we were sitting down with you and Kristen for dinner one day and um, it came up and you're like, oh God, all, all the tests that you did were wrong. This is what you got to do. You got to look at this one and here's the stool test and blah, blah, blah. Long story short, he ended up with leaky gut mm. and everything that we did prior to actually finding out the cause of, you know, his swelling, his weight gain, um, his family is like riddled with autoimmune kind of conditions. Really? So that would have been down the pike. Uh, but if it wasn't for actually finding out what made him gain all of that weight yeah. and feel like crap and have the brain fog, I don't know that we would have ever taken the time to actually learn mm -hmm. all the ins and outs, the actual physiology, like how to look at lab work, um, understanding the nutrition behind what can drive a certain condition or right. I, I don't think we would have done it if it personally didn't affect our life. Yeah. I think that's reality right there. And I mean, I remember when I got involved in functional medicine is because I uh, was near the end of grad school 
and I started gaining weight. My stress values were going up because I was like, what am I going to, what am I going to do with my life? You know, that kind of thing. What do I want to plan on? What do I want to focus on? And uh, my energy tanked and I was going through like 400 milligrams of caffeine a day just to like keep the lights on. And it's kind of the same idea. So it has to hit you personally, I think, mm -hmm. in order to be in that spot. Um, and from a patient perspective, you, you have treated many, 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 many patients over the last five or six years, like mm -hmm. a ton. There are very okay. few uh, functional minded practices in the United States that have handled a higher volume of patients than you and Niles. And I say that not to like, you know, uh, inflate your ego or anything. I say that because there's a amount of work that goes into each patient case that I don't mm -hmm. think uh, patients see number one, but then I don't think people understand when they're like, Oh, I do nutrition. Do you know what I mean? When like, Oh yeah, we do nutrition in our clinic. And there's this level of care that goes into it. Do you, that level of care, is that something that it was just in you and functional medicine kind of draws it out? Or is that level of care something that you cultivate within your patient base? I think it's both. Um, I've always been an empathetic. I, mm -hmm. I get affected by other people's emotions very easily. So if somebody is very sad or having a bad day or whatever, like when I'm sitting in front of a patient and they're telling me their story and they're crying, it takes every ounce of energy for me not to cry with them. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd, I'd be lying if I said I didn't shed a couple of tears with patients yeah. you know, the first time meeting them. Um, but when you become passionate about something and you know that there's a better outcome for these people, it just draws it out of you. And what I try and do is I really try and find out what is the person going through? What are they looking for? And is it actually something that I can help with? Mm -hmm. There's people who come in with unrealistic expectations or they come in with conditions that I'm just not comfortable with. And I have no problem saying, look, really sorry, but I don't feel that I'm the right doctor for you. You know, maybe look over at this uh, professional or, right. you know, here's a couple books to try and get them into the right headspace or whatever yeah. I meet, need to do because, you, like you know, it, it does take a lot of work, not just on the patient's end, but it takes a ton of work on the practitioner's end, figuring out, okay, where is their problem? What's going on? How many layers are involved? How do yeah. we change the diet? So it's not just a, this is your diet. This is how you're going to eat the rest of your life. It's right. okay. Let's, let's start playing with this. Let's start playing with some intermittent fasting or some block fasting or some diet variation or um, whatever it may be. And everyone's going to respond differently and you have to be able to know what to look for and then how to appropriately change it based on what the patient's dealing with. One of the biggest things that I find is something that you touched on with the unrealistic expectation and it's almost um, it's almost like patients, they don't believe they can get better. And then when you tell them, hey, here are some things that you could work on. Here's what you can expect. Sometimes I feel like you give them an inch and they'll take a mile from an expectation perspective. Yeah. And what they don't realize is that it's not a doctor heal me type of a situation. If I have a headache and I'm a chiropractor, right? And I go see another chiropractor, I'm expecting that doctor to remove my headache, even right. though it's ultimately my responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. As the person holding the problem. Right. And I feel like when a, a patient has unrealistic expectations, it's almost because they are over, um, like, I don't, they don't have the ability to set small goals because it's like a, a humility situation. You know what I mean? Like if you want to reverse your diabetes, right? Medical literature is really explicit that that's possible. You could do it. Yep. It's not a Dr. Heal me situation though. Like I'm not going to go to Dr. Caitlin and then all of a sudden you're going to whack me on the head and I'm better. There's the oh my goodness. If I wish. Yeah. <laughs> I wish too. There are these things that these, these checkpoints that you have to hit as a patient and mm -hmm you almost have to be willing to set small enough goals. Like mm -hmm. believe in yourself. Yes. But not to the extent that you're like, Oh, I can reverse diabetes. Right. Well, my There's favorite. a whole bunch of smaller things in there. Do you know what I'm saying? 
I totally get it. My favorite is always the weight loss component. Yeah, um, absolutely. No matter, almost, almost everybody that I sit down with, no, so I say almost, they want to lose weight and they haven't been able to lose weight. Mm -hmm. And so when you ask them, okay, realistically, how much weight do you want to lose in six months? I always get the most like absurd numbers, like 80 pounds. And I'm like, right. when's the last time you lost 20 pounds? Oh, I haven't lost 20 pounds in 30 years. Okay, well, let's maybe start at 20. Right. And then let's work our way up to 80. Because I think part of it is people think if the goal that I set is going to be it and I'm going to stop there and there's going to be no more improvement. Yeah. But that's not how your body works. And if you go see, you know, a really good functional medicine doctor, they're not going to put you on these crash things. And they're not, their goal is not to have you lose a hundred pounds in six months. Right. It's let's fix the problems and your body's going to automatically start dropping the weight based on how your body's meant to. That's why some people can lose 10 pounds the first month and some people don't lose 10 pounds till month three, you know, but it's, right. I think it's, uh, it's more of a, if I only say I'm going to lose 20 pounds, that's it. Right. That's right. And, and the person that wants to lose 80 pounds, um, the first question is, is are you willing to drink more water? Right. And if you're not willing to do that, there's no way that you're going to hit your goal. Like, it's the small things. Are you willing to eat a little bit more broccoli this week? Are you willing to set down the bagel, so to speak? And yeah. those little goals, like you got to have some level of humility to just say today, today I'm going to do 1% better than yesterday. You know, like today I'm going to do the water. <laughs> today, Tomorrow I'm going to worry about the bagel versus being like, ah, it's all, it's all got to be there. And then you only lose five pounds in the first week. And you go, oh my goodness, this is going to take me until next Christmas in order to, to get to this spot. Like that's that level of humility, I think is, is key from a patient perspective. Communicating that to a patient is an art that most chiropractors, most nutritionists, um, they don't have because they themselves don't follow that. And I, I think that's something key that I've picked up from your podcast, listening to, it's called Women in Wellness, by the way. Mm -hmm. And you guys do a really great job. And one of the things you talk about are the, I call them the tragic things of life that just weigh people down. And that's one of them is being yeah. able to have humility in, in your own life. Because everybody wants to put on a good face. You know, everybody wants to be like, hey, I'm this powerful person and my uh, metabolism is off the charts. I can eat whatever I want. And uh, that type of a situation. And there's a little bit more reality to it than that. And so I appreciate that you guys highlight that. Well, and I think no matter who you are, you're going to have challenging days or weeks or months or heck, you might even have a challenging year. But just because you fall off the bandwagon doesn't mean you can't get back on. And that's something mm -hmm. that I think everybody needs to be okay with. It's, it's okay if you're not perfect. Nobody's perfect, but mm -hmm. it's the progress that's the important part. And if you're constantly moving forward, then you have no other, there's no other option but to start to see the results and get better. But you have to make, like you said, that decision and mm -hmm. just start moving in the direction that you eventually want to end up. One of the beautiful things, I think, in functional medicine or functional health model or even clinical nutrition one of the beautiful things is that you start to see the body for what it's actually capable of mm -hmm. and your level of respect for me, my level of respect for people in general has grown so much. The more that I see in FM, just because you know what the body is capable of. When you look at disease as a counter mechanism or a counterbalance rather than just a problem that needs to be removed, mm -hmm. um, the intelligence that's in there is stunning. It's amazing what the body can do. It's stunning. It's there's this, there's this thing. Um, and you've probably seen it with diabetes patients where when you show them, Hey, guess what? The diabetes, the diabetic response that your body is having right now is actually protecting you from cell death. You know what happens after cell death and you show them that and they're like grateful for it. Rather than being like, I got the diabetes, doc, you know, mm -hmm. and they're like grateful for that response and they start to treat their body differently. Like instead of, oh, this thing is, is betraying me after 65 years, 
It's more like they start working with it. And I think that's chiropractic at its very core. Mm -hmm. Are you seeing, what are, what are you seeing um, when you look at disease and dysfunction in the body? How do you perceive it? So at the very core, if you're going to go down to the very basic level, it's mm -hmm. cellular inflammation. That is the number one cause for whatever disease process is happening. But how it's affecting the person or where it's affecting them is going to be what they end up showing up with. So what they express, whether it's autoimmune thyroid, diabetes, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, um, whatever. And so really it's just getting down and figuring out, okay, what is and where is the problem coming from? So like with diabetes, it's the membranes are um, inflamed. Mm -hmm. The receptors just aren't able to communicate. So they can't take the sugar from the blood into the cells and therefore it backs up. And mm -hmm. that's a really simplistic way of looking at it. There's, there's a whole lot of other things that happen, but when you actually address why the inflammation's there and you can get the body communicating again, that's when the magic happens. The body goes, oh my gosh, it's still there. I can still do this. Or, <laughs> oh my gosh, you know, like I can lose the weight. I didn't know the fat was there in the first right. place. To burn. So it's, it's really fun breaking things down and really just going from a bare bones foundation area. Like where is the problem arising from? And it's going to be different or it's going to affect everybody differently, but ultimately you got to look at everybody for who they are and right. what they're dealing with. Right. I think one of the things that gets me so excited about chiropractic in 2018 is the ability to speak about these things in um, easily understood terms. Mm -hmm. And 10 years ago, I don't think that existed because the foundation of all of these people that have come before us, was not there. And we we're just trying to figure out how do you explain uh, cellular respiration to a patient in like 12 words, you know, and right. that foundation that's been set by these people that have come before us is something that you almost take for granted now because it's just part of your everyday language. Is there a source in functional medicine right now that um, you find valuable? Like who do you read? Where do you study? Who? Well, so <laughs> I do a lot. Um, I listen to a lot of different podcasts. I listen uh -huh. to your podcast. Um, I will dabble with like some of um, like Dr. Mark Hyman, Dr. Amy Myers, just because I want to know what patients are hearing. Mm -hmm. um, I want to know what are they hearing? How is it being explained? And is it appropriate? And right. for the most part, it is. Um, I just completed the certification in functional medicine. I'm going to go ahead and do the rest of it to write the diplomate in mm -hmm. uh, the clinical nutrition part. Um, where else do I go? I actually almost went to salt med in Colorado Springs this year, but unfortunately we had a family wedding the same weekend, mm. but it's just going to a whole bunch of different conferences. And like um, right now I'm super interested in actually holistic dentistry. Okay, so that's, that's where, cool. that's where most of my, um, studying and research has been recently but All right there's so many different podcasts and youtube and it's not even just the functional aspect it's listening to things like meditation and yoga and mental clarity and you know how do you release a situation that's just been bogging you down like you had this one patient and they were a total thorn in your back and they've just mm -hmm. been like you know saying and going against opposite of everything that you're you're wanting to tell them or you're wanting them to do and it's like okay how do I just release this and how how did I create this because part of it is you created it so I've never had that problem so I don't I don't know oh, well, teach me your ways <laughs> I just get it so there's a uh, a saying in chiropractic and in nutrition where people want to be principled providers like I'm a principled oh, yeah. chiropractor you know yeah and one of the things I found is that when you ask about it, they don't really know oftentimes what those principles are. Um, do, are there a set of principles that you use in practice? Like, are there anything that, like all this information you're pulling from different industries, it could be health and fitness, it could be MDs. Um, you talk about Mark Hyman. 
Are there yeah. principles that you take and you sift all that information through to make sure that it still fits the paradigm of what you're practicing? Yes. So for me, I have to look at the person as a whole. And as soon as I start treating them as parts, yeah. that's a big issue. Okay. Um, so physically, what are they dealing with? Is it, um, it could be a specific organ or muscle pain or back pain or headaches or whatever it is, but what are they emotionally going through? You know, are they dealing with depression, anxiety? Mm -hmm. Were they abused as a kid? Um, are they in an abusive relationship now? Oh, do they hate their life? Do they hate their job? You know, are they struggling with their kids? Whatever it is. Um, and the way that I look at it is I let them tell me everything because that's part of healing. Mm -hmm. And they'll, don't get me wrong. Sometimes things will come up where I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. All right. We're going to talk to somebody else about this or right. let's send you somebody else because I'm not qualified for that. Yeah. But part of it is addressing them as a whole. So if you look at the definition of what health is, it's not just, you know, the absence of disease, but it's physically, mentally, emotionally being stable and healthy and happy. And so for me, it's really looking at the person as a whole and how are they doing with all aspects of their life, not just they're tired or they have a headache right. or they have diabetes or whatever it is. Right. There's a, a movement in healthcare right now, um, starts with medicine and it probably started in medicine back in, I don't know, in the 1950s. If you start looking at the research and maybe I just, I don't know if you do that, but the point is, is that there's this movement where, um, the doctor will take responsibility for the patient's condition and ultimately it's so they can own the responsibility or like the glory when the case turns out the right way. Right. Like it's the whole vaccination situation where you get a vaccination and now you don't get the disease and the doctor's like, yes, I nailed it. Right. I got it. And that's cool. Cause there's been a ton of people helped by that type of a, a mindset. But on the other side of it, it doesn't work very well for chronic disease and mm -mm. it still exists. The standard in the standard of care, it still exists. It's the doctor's uh, win and the doctor's loss, but the doctor really doesn't take control of the loss. It's usually like, well, you're just a terrible patient. Yeah, you're um, not doing what I told you to do. Yeah, that happens in chiropractic as well, right? Like, I'm going to adjust you 14 times, um, which would be on the low side of, let's say, a chronic low back pain situation. If it's not getting better, well, Bob, you need to lose some weight, right? And you're not it's stretching. like. Yeah, exactly. It's like that type of a, a style. In, and I, it's like this thing where chiropractic wasn't there. That's not what started the movement, so to speak. If you read a green book, even three pages in a green book, you see that it's, it's a little different story than that. And I feel like right now, um, like a word picture would be this. It's kind of like somebody who's surfing, uh, taking credit for the wave, you know? And, and that's kind of the situation in healthcare right now. It, do you feel that when you're practicing on a daily basis? Um, no, because I set a very specific expectation and standard before I even accept somebody. So I let them know, look, if we're going to work together, this is a partnership and I can't get you better if you don't do what I tell you to do. Right. Um, you know, and I'm not going to force you to do anything. This, that's not how this works. We're adults. We get to choose what we do. If you're mm. going to choose to do what I tell you to do, then yes, your body's going to heal and you're going to achieve those goals and see those results that you want. But um, a lot of times I, I try and mush that before it ever becomes a problem just because you're exactly right. People come back and say, well, you didn't work. Well, no, it wasn't. I didn't work. You didn't do anything I told you to do. Right. Right. So, that's, and I don't know if that's necessarily the patient's fault. You know what I mean? No. A it's lot just, of times it's not. Yeah. It's habits, right? And it's, yeah. if you look at what we're indoctrinated with on a daily basis, right. like, you know, TV commercials, like I don't even have TV because I hate the commercials. I, mm -hmm. I refuse. It's in every magazine. So the magazines in my waiting room, I rip out all of those stupid, like yeah. drug, like Zarelto. Have, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You feel sad? Take this. Ask right. your doctor if this is appropriate. So we're we're bombarded with it on a daily basis. And it's always, it's not your fault. It's not your fault. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not the food. 
um, the FDA would never put something out that would be unhealthy or harmful to us, you know? That, that saying there that you said, it's not your fault, it's telling the patient that, you're almost, a doctor is telling a patient that because you don't want the patient to feel bad about who they are, mm -hmm. right? And I think the issue is, is that their health has become their identity or rather the disease has become their identity. And you like the, the message of functional medicine and chiropractic is almost something where it's like, yeah, you are like, you're a good person, right? Like you're okay where you're at, but don't stay there. Right. It's not, it's not your identity. The disease isn't. And to be able to say you need help or do this instead, or this is how you're going to lose 80 pounds. It can't be an assault on a patient's identity. And that's something that I think is an art to communicate. It is. You have to be very ginger with the words. <laughs> you use. Yeah. Um, yeah. And ultimately what I find helps a lot is when you use the words that they use. Hmm. So if they say, I feel really shitty. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then you find out why. And then when you're going back over and you're like, okay, well, what would feeling less shitty look like <laughs> <laughs> to them? Right. And right. they totally connect. Cause they're like, Oh my gosh, you know, she's speaking my language. She's, right. she's listening. Like she, she understands what I'm dealing with. And I think when they know that you're on their team and they, mm -hmm. they know that you're listening, they're more likely to do the things that should be done in order to, to get a different result. But with that being said, there's still going to be some people out there who just aren't ready. And that's totally fine too. Yeah. Well, absolutely. I think if a population the size of uh, where you're at in Bellevue, you're probably going to find a, quite a few people that aren't ready. But, I do. Yeah. But I also tell them, you know, I'll be here when you are ready. So, yeah. you know, yeah. it, it's totally fine. Everybody's on their own journey. It's, it's helping those that are ready to take a different path. That's cool. That's fun. So let's talk about your podcast a little bit, Women in Wellness. How did it come yeah. about? So I'm not one to, I hate videos. I hate putting myself out there. I, mm -hmm. I just, I like doing public speaking when I have like a certain thing that I'm going to talk about and yeah. I know exactly what I'm talking about. But the idea of a podcast and me doing it over and over um, like what you're doing scared the hell out of me and not many things scare me, but <laughs> how this came about was I've been seeing younger and younger and younger females, especially coming in with very serious um, condition symptoms. And I'm yeah. sick of it. Like it is not okay for me to have an 11 year old come in diagnosed with an autoimmune thyroid disease, type one diabetes because of, you know, a vaccine that they got cause they got bit by a dog that's actually something that I've seen and mm. I'm just not okay with it. I, I'm sick of these kids coming in because their life expectancy is going to be terrible. So um, I knew that if I was going to do this, I needed to do it with some like-minded practitioners um, to hold me accountable, to make me do it, but also to keep it a little bit more engaging, um, yeah, more conversational. conversational. Yeah. yeah. Like what you do. And um, so I found well, I didn't find um, two uh, fantastic females in my circle. Um, one of them's Mindy, and she's in California. She's also a DC that practices functional medicine. Mm -hmm. And Sonia is a naturopath up in Canada um, that practices more on the functional medicine style. Yeah. And we just have a great time, like getting on these things and just talking about what do we see, what can people do differently, you know, what are we struggling with, what. And we're just pretty raw about it. Like, look, everybody deals with this, but this is what we can do differently. Or, hey, like, we'll talk about the FDA. We'll talk about, I don't know, different options for food. Like, how do you read a food label? Um, we've talked about fasting. You know, we'll dive more into it. But just really applicable things that the general public can start to implement to hopefully avoid them ending up with some full blown, you know, chronic disease that isn't going to get better. It's just going to get worse without making those changes anyway. So That's right. we'd like to try and nip it in the butt before it becomes, uh, you know, a huge concern or a big issue. That's cool. I, one of the things that I like about your podcast is the conversational tone of it. You get three different people with three different experiences 
-hmm. oftentimes you arrive at the same conclusion, but sometimes you don't. And I think that's the best part is like, well, this is what I would do. And, um, and I think that's an important characteristic to it because the more tools that you have, the more strategies that you have as a functional provider, um, not only the more people you're going to be able to serve, but the better you're going to be, the better you become. Mm -hmm. And I find that, uh, for whatever reason, maybe this is just me, but you attract the patients into your practice and into your life. Um, and they tend to mirror the broken edges of your own life, you know, and it's, it's really weird how it works, but it's also kind of fun because you know that next month's going to be different than this month. If you're working on yourself, um, the, the people that come in, it's just unique. It's, it's really interesting. Um, it is it's fun when you have different people conversing too, because they're going to say things differently. Yeah, for sure. So, and it just means that it, someone's going to learn it better from Mindy than they are from me or that's from right. Sonia or from you. And that's the beautiful part behind the podcast. That's cool. I think one of the things that you're going to find as you go is, is that the topics are going to become more and more uh, deep dives on things because you've satisfied all of the periphery and so you're going to you're going to satisfy a whole section of your audience and they're going to be like well what about this i didn't know we could talk about this and there comes the next layer and i think that's just uh the way healthcare is moving in the next decade but it's pretty cool um have you come across anything in functional medicine that you think is uh, up and coming, cutting edge, or anything interesting that you haven't seen a whole lot of yet? Uh, well, what I think is extremely interesting, and I think more doctors should really look into, is when you have somebody who has a chronic condition that just doesn't seem to be getting better, there's something going on in their mouth. And I'm not just talking about gingivitis. I'm talking like root canals, amalgam fillings, so silver fillings. I'm talking about cavitations. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about like some really nasty stuff going on in the mouth. And we really need more holistic dentists out there who are practicing really safe dentistry versus just the patchwork kind of thing. Like, oh, you have a cavity here. Let's just fill it. Well, why do you have a cavity? Your mouth and your gut are tied. And so um, a lot of the research that I'm finding is when you have problems in your mouth, you have them in your gut. When you have problems in your gut, you end up with them in your mouth. And so I really think that that's a, the next layer for functional health or functional medicine is yeah. really diving in and making sure that the oral, um, somebody's oral health is where it should be. Have you um, heard of IAOMT? Sure have. Yeah. Yeah. So I went to one of their summits, uh, maybe a couple of years ago now in Florida, and I got to sit in on a meeting with the board uh, that runs it. And so I'm sitting there wondering how I find myself in this dental groups board meeting, right? And what they're asking about is how the functional movement in healthcare is going to affect legislation and all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm really the right person for you to talk to about this. But one of the things that I found out is that all of the garbage that goes on in the functional world from a legal perspective, from a um, control perspective, from like a media perspective, all of that's happening to these people times 10. Yep. Times 10. And it's stunning. It's stunning. And to see how they've organized to not protect themselves, because I think that individually each of them would give up their own practice if it meant the advancement of their, uh, you know, the, the niche that they're in. And, it's really to protect the choice for patients. And um, I just thought that was pretty inspiring. So if you ever, if you're listening to this and you don't know who I'm talking about, go to IAOMT.org and just they have a video tab. Click on the videos and watch some of this stuff. It is, it's awesome. Um, a little infuriating, but it's awesome because of the information that they're just putting out there right now. Well, and it's just crazy. Like some of the things, like I'm, undoing everything that was done to me as yeah. <laughs> a little kid now. And so it's just crazy, yeah. you know, and um, I really wish that, well, but it's the same. I was going to say, I really wish there was more dentists, but I really wish there was more chiropractors and more MDs and more DOs that practice the functional aspect too. Yeah. So it's just going to take time. It's going to take time. And the thing that I really wish people would, um, 
would come to terms with is not everybody wants the functional approach. Right. Not everybody wants to make the changes. Not everybody wants to do what it takes. And so there's always going to need to be a need for traditional medications. There's always going to be a need for surgery and that's totally fine. Mm -hmm. But let the person or the patient determine what's right for them and where to go and who to see and how to approach their condition versus everybody attacking everybody. What you do is wrong. What you do is wrong. This is right. You're, you know, like, I really think there's a time and a place for everybody. And, you know, I think five years ago I was in a much more uh, fighting mood. And if you talk to me, I would certainly like, I'll just talk for an hour if you want me to. But um, I think as time goes on and you start to see the reason for some of the the things that take place, um, I'm all right with it. Like I'm even okay with some of the battle that happens because out of the battle comes, um, you know, new and different privileges for people and new and different options. And just because something gets uh, turned to the left doesn't mean it's destroyed, you know, or turned to the right doesn't mean it's destroyed. Not politically. I just mean, (laughs) not politically. You're going down that road now, huh? No, no, no. Um, But the point is, is that I think there's value in the struggle. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I think if the functional mindset, the functional model, it's not even a profession. Like that's the thing. It's just a lens to look through um, from other professions. Yeah. And I think that if it's going to be worth its salt, you got to go through some of this stuff that's out there right now. And what you're going to find is that the literature in the long run is going to back you up. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, and it's one of those things where if you're not claiming anything that hasn't been proven true in research, yeah. then there's really nothing to stand on for mm-hmm. whoever is saying that it can't be done. Like the diabetes can't be reversed. That's one of those things where it's like, really? It says uh, it in medical yeah. literature. And there's hundreds of practitioners across the United States that see it happen every day in their office, mine included. Like, we actually have medical doc, a medical doctor who is no longer diabetic, doesn't mm-hmm. take any thyroid medication. And she goes, don't take this the wrong way, but I honestly didn't think that you knew what the hell you were going to be talking about because, <laughs> one, you look way too young, and two, you're a chiropractor. There you go. And I was like, well... And she's like, but my goodness, do you guys know a lot more than what I originally thought? There you go. It's you know, when you look at the individual, nobody's ever going to tell the individual you can't reverse your blood sugar situation. Nobody's ever going to say that. But when you look at diabetics collectively, people are going to fight you tooth and nail for that. And it's just, it's just if you talk in identities, it's a problem. But if you talk as a singularity, as a person, if you get down to the root of what's going on with an individual, nobody's ever going to fight you on that. And I think that's a message that nutritionists need to hear, chiropractors need to hear, functional-minded people need to hear because the, uh, the pull is to talk about diabetics, to talk about autoimmune patients, to talk about thyroid patients, to talk about you know, cognitive decline patients. Sure. And, and that one's touchy. Right. That one but is touchy. If you can talk about the person instead of the collective group, that's where you start to make changes. And ultimately, we're only going to be as good as the last story that came out of our office, you know? Um, and that's, that is, I just, I just think that's something that moving forward um, is important to remember for people. So, hmm. Have you seen any of the work that's going into the cognitive decline stuff right now? I have, and it's fascinating. It's It's, so cool, some of the stuff that they're doing. Um, And it's really fun because some of the things that that they're doing, um, Niles and I have been implementing into our office just for general health stuff like fasting and, you know, ketosis Mm -hmm. and checking that. And we've been doing that for the past three years. So it's really cool to see that how they're um, taking some of those things and implementing them into a massive problem. Like Alzheimer's is devastating to not only the individual, but the families. I can speak personal experience. 
the gentleman that uh, wrote the book, so to speak, Dr. Bredesen, he boiled his approach down into three situations that can cause Alzheimer's, right? Hot, cold, and vile. And I don't know if he intended to do this, but you can boil down any chronic disease into those three categories. And yeah. it might manifest as Alzheimer's for somebody, but it might manifest as diabetes or hair loss for somebody else or just fatigue. And I thought, wow, that happened 25 years after uh, the functional movement began. And he just summed it up in three words, hot, cold, and vile. And, uh, and I think that's something that is going to catapult the FM uh, group into the, the future here is pretty cool. There are a lot of doctors participating in the cognitive decline area right now because the stakes are so high for the patients. And um, in your experience, how, how long was the process of decline? Like how long did it take before you were like, that is not the person that I knew? Um, so we, we, well, I actually noticed it right before I moved to Minnesota from Canada for school. Mm -hmm. When I went to go say bye to my grandma, um, she didn't recognize me. Mm. And yeah, it wasn't that she didn't know my name and she didn't recognize me. And it was from then it, it was okay. Cause she said she just had a senior moment, you know? Um, but within a couple of years, my dad had to move her into his house she got really aggressive, um, would like wake up and call the cops because she didn't recognize my dad. Like it, it wasn't pretty. Oh no. Um, and then eventually hospice. And it got to the point where, you know, I wasn't her granddaughter. I was her, um, sister or her daughter. And then I was her sister. And then, you know, like it just kept going back. So the whole thing was probably about eight years, but wow, it wasn't, it wasn't pretty. Hmm. Hmm. Your, so, that, that experience, how long, um, and if you don't want to talk about it, that's fine. But how long did it take you to get to a spot where you're like ready to go help that person now? You know, like you see that person walk into your clinic. Um, are you in a spot where you're like, you know what, let's do this. Let's figure this out. Are you there? I'm a hundred percent there. The biggest hurdle is, are they there? Mm -hmm. um, the way that I look at it is I, I would love to help every single person, United States, Canada, around the world, but I know that's just not realistic. Mm -hmm. But what I've come to terms with is I can only help those that want to help themselves. And so if somebody is truly ready to make changes and get the help that they're looking for, there's, there are hundreds of doctors out there like mm -hmm. me, like you that would bend over backwards to figure out what's going on and put the best action plan forward for them in order to see the results that they're looking for. But for me, it's not so much a matter of, am I ready to do it? I'm when, as soon as I step into the office, my game face is on, like, let's do this. If I can help you, let's do this. But is there, is there any, uh, type of condition that you don't like to see in your clinic? Cancer scares me. Mm -hmm. And the reason cancer scares me is because a lot of the supplements and things that we do could potentially change how the chemo, the radiation, how that works. And so mm -hmm. if chemo radiation fails, which it does quite awesome. often, I just don't want to be blamed for, well, you took these supplements and that's sure. why this happen. Um, but outside of cancer, you know, if I can find out what's going on, that's a big thing. If I can find yeah. the cause, no problem. If I can't find out what's, what's causing their symptom or their disease, then there's not much that I can do for the individual. Cause I don't, I don't know which direction to go with them. I think, um, what you're going to find in the next decade is more and more off the shelf stuff for patients to do their own exploration mm -hmm. you see this with some of the labs right now, you can get your own DNA testing and interpretation, not just like, Hey, you're 40% uh, Swedish, right? But you can get DNA testing and interpretation as to what genetic SNPs that you have, uh, you know, that are causing X, Y, and Z symptoms. You can get all that stuff without a provider. Mm -hmm. And I think 
one of the areas in functional medicine that's going to explode moving forward is that, that genetic component to it, not just uh, endocrinology, which that, that was at one point in time, that was the future of FM is endocrinology. And now the genetic situation has come upon uh, the providers here and what's your take on uh, genetics one, but, the expression of genes? Like, how do you see those things right now in clinical practice? Yeah, great question. I was actually going to ask you the same question, your opinion on that. Um, uh -huh. Honestly, there's some gene snips. So like, let's talk MTHFR, because that's like the biggest, yeah. like, that's what everybody talks about. I have a homozygous, I have heterozygous, I have this SNP, that SNP, MTHFR. There's some people that have those SNPs that have um, problems, right? Like they have mm -hmm. symptoms, they, they have issues. And then there's other people who have the SNPs who have absolutely no problems with it. Now, the thing about SNPs is those cannot be turned on and off. That's, that's what you're dealt with. There's right. no changing it. Whereas other genetic problems, whether it's triggered environmentally or... Um, Stress-wise, you can turn those on and off. So when it comes to the SNPs, I don't know personally enough as to whether or not every person, and this is my belief, every person that has a SNP is going to experience XYZ. I don't believe that um, right. because I've had people who've had, come in with all these tests and some experience things and others don't. So whether it's the SNP that's causing it or contributing. I don't know that I have the answer for that. What yeah. are your thoughts? Um, based off of what I've read and there's always more to read, right? Of course. But based off of what I currently understand, the thing that I see happening in clinical practice with patients right now is, is that they're dealt a set of cards, like you say, okay, specific genetic SNPs, et cetera, and some function awesome, increased function, and I think those are sometimes countermeasures for ones that suck on further on down. But um, I look at it as a filter, and everybody has to wedge their lifestyle through that filter, and whatever comes out on the other end is uh, obviously the resultant health condition. And so you're not going to change the DNA, but you'll change the expression of it for sure. And so when you talk about that type of a thing, what I hope happens in functional medicine is that the DNA availability for the tests and the interpretation circles back and reinforces that you are the one in charge of your health. And because diabetes runs in your family doesn't mean that you just got to get kicked in the face by diabetes, right? Like your, change your lifestyle, you know? If your hand's burning because it's on the stove, move it. And, and that, that mentality, I hope is what is reinforced rather than like, it's just a white flag. You see all these genetic snips and you're like, Oh, I'm screwed. Right. And you just do whatever you want. Well, and it's normally, well, I just have to take the methylated version and it's right. like, Oh, okay. That's only one small piece. Right. Especially when you talk about methylation and MTHFR, what I'm, what I'm looking at is Sometimes when people talk about DNA data, they get so into the forest, right? That they're looking at not just a tree. They're not just looking at a stick off the tree. They're looking at like one tenth of a leaf on a tree in the forest. And they're like, this is it. This is the thing that was causing my issue. And, and I hesitate as a provider, as a doctor to say, uh, that that's okay <laughs> because there's so much more to it. Like, um, I mean, you look at the expression of inflammation. So I, okay. So I just did this webinar the other day on NF Kappa beta. Okay. And cool. so I'm doing all this research on NF Kappa beta and, and what's there in the medical literature basically reinforces the chiropractic paradigm from an adjustments perspective. And you look at it and you're like, this is insane. But what happens is that that research gets buried because people look at NF kappa beta as a genetic expression and you go, it's not like that, right? Your choices matter. And I think that's the message that uh, I hope comes out of all this DNA research. I would love it if 
getting that DNA research or really getting any testing done, the whole purpose behind it is to make a shift somewhere else so that you can improve whatever the test comes right. out with. Right. And it's not just a take this pill or take this supplement. It's a, okay, let's make a lifestyle change. Let's make a habit change. Let's get some appropriate sleep. Let's not go to bed at two in the morning and wake up at six because right. you can run on four hours of sleep. Baloney. Right. Baloney, you can't. It's going to catch up and bite you in the keister. But I really, really would love if when people got labs done, no matter what, if it was more of a, okay, how can we address this? What can we do to fix this versus, oh, here, just take this pill, no matter what yeah. the pill is. Exactly. Supplement, doesn't matter. Exactly. Like, there's this thing in traditional chiropractic, like I'm talking stuff from 1910, right? Where they're honoring what every body has, right? And I feel like that's the message of functional medicine, at least my version of functional medicine, is honor what's there instead of trying to fix or replace or downregulate or upregulate or whatever. Like it's not about changing that. It's about honoring what's there. And when you work with that power in the body that heals the edges of a cut together, um, even with DNA information, when you work with it, people's lives change. And I think that's uh, like the message that I hope the functional community can continue to put out there because it's getting lost in the insurance-based chiropractic world. That's just my opinion, but that's like honor what's there, right? That's, that's the thing that I'm excited about. So. Yeah. Hmm. And it would be wonderful to see more practitioners honoring the patient in front of them for where they're at and yeah. what they're dealing with and where they want to go because where you might want them to go might not be where they want to go. That's right. You know, sometimes I have higher expectations or I, I want them to get better more or end up with at a certain level and they're not looking for that. They're just looking for this. And That's right. I have to be okay with that because it's not me and I'll still, you know, hold, I want you to be here. I'd like you to improve to here, but you know, if you're happy and you reach that goal, then cool. Right. Give them, tell them what they need. Give them what they want. Where'd you hear that back in the day? Right. So, all right. Well, Dr. Caitlin, thank you for the conversation today. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Tell the listeners where we can find you. Well, you can find uh, the Women in Wellness podcast. So it's like women, the letter N, wellness, um, on iTunes. I think we're up Perfect. on YouTube. I don't do any of that stuff, seriously. It's <laughs> right. um, but, you know, like I said, I hate doing videos, but I started doing um, just some Facebook things, um, mm -hmm. short videos that people can start implementing to make small changes that will make a large impact that doesn't cost you anything. So you can find me on my Facebook page, or if you really want, you can search me out in Bellevue, Washington at Functional Health Center of Bellevue. Awesome. Is that a dot .com? Um, no, yes. <laughs> okay, just checking. So, all right. What's the uh, office number out there? Uh, 425. Oh my God, what is our office number? <laughs> 42551, no. Wait a minute. You don't know, you don't ever call your office, do you? I never call my office. No. Um, who calls their own office? And besides, we have we have speed dial now. That's right, that's right. 425-556-1212. All right, thanks for being with us today, I appreciate it. Great speaking with you again, Brad. Thanks for having me.